I'd like to welcome everyone to Figma for Education's Early Career Week series, where we're focusing on design portfolios. We heard from you time and time again that one of the biggest barriers for that students and early career folks are facing when uh, is to create a strong portfolio that showcases your talent, your personality, and your skills, right? It's quite the balancing act. Yesterday, we talked about the foundations of a good design portfolio, and we even looked at some examples to see those best practices in action. We built each of these sessions, the session yesterday, the one today, and the one tomorrow, to build upon each other right? Culminating in, in these two days, right? Today is the first of portfolio reviews. Tomorrow is a day of portfolio reviews. Today, we brought on experts from our network of designers that have generously, you know, are providing their time today uh, with the goal of giving you a broad range of perspectives and ideas that you can incorporate while building out your own body of work, your own portfolio of work. Today's session is going to be a one hour portfolio review. Um, hosted by this panel of experienced designers. We're going to aim to review about five to six portfolios that were submitted from early career and student designers within this amazing Figma community. All right. So um, once again, before we uh, review our first portfolio, uh, we are going to uh, introduce our panelists. Okay. So today we have uh, Crandall, he's a human-centered product designer and creative strategist currently working at Landing, a creative escape on the internet. He currently leads both the product and design teams. Alex has spent the last eight years problem-solving and building experiences at the intersection of product, brand, and service. He's partnered with teams like Nike, Sweet Green, Lord Abbott, and more to ship a transformative and fun tools throughout the world. Uh, we also have Bobbert. Bobbert is a bumbling queer brand and product designer based in Pittsburgh, currently a senior product designer at Duolingo. Uh, we have the uh, 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 joy of, of hosting Bobbert in the Duolingo panel at Config this year. You could check out that talk on YouTube. It was an amazing one. Uh, as a designer, they care a ton about bridging product with creative direction, having worked on illustration-led rebrands, design system, visual reboots, and a zero-to-one new product developments that heavily feature the Duolingo world characters. Outside of work, they spend too much time watching reality TV game shows, playing Nintendo games, and breaking the fashion binary. Love that. Next up, we have Chia. Chia is a product designer at Figma working on prototyping currently based in the Bay Area. They also work as a creative technologist, internet artist, and community organizer. Folks, say hi. Say hi to the people out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, y'all could say hi. Okay. Well, anyways, everybody at home loads, everybody at home saying hi. All right. We'll we'll get to y'all in just a moment, anyways. All right, cool. Um the one thing that we are going to do, so we're going to begin reviewing portfolios today. I'm going to head on over to our special Fig Jam document. Um, we're going to get started reviewing portfolios, but before we do, please keep in mind that all the portfolios reviewed today were created by a student or an early career designer who poured a lot of time effort and love into their portfolios. Please be kind and respectful and thoughtful when weighing in in that chat in the review. So remember, please, this is holding space and being kind to these individuals. We will be providing a link to each portfolio that we review in the chat so you can follow along while the reviewers are voicing over their notes. Now that we've got that under their belts, let's move on. All right, so before we get started, I do wanna provide a little bit more context. Yesterday, we had the amazing Tammy, a fellow Figmate, a product designer here at Figma, talk a little bit about some important aspects of building a portfolio. So here, when I look at Tammy's slides, right, these are some of the main points, providing project context, letting folks know all of the ins and outs of like who was working on this project, what was their timeline like? right? We emphasize the importance of showing iterations or trade-offs, right? Showing how a design evolved and the intentionality behind it. We've also talked about the importance of quality over quantity, right? Focusing on the why and the how when you are uh, building out a, a piece of work, right? 
making sure you include lessons, next steps, uh, making sure that at its core, it is easy to read and navigate. Um, also, the fact that so many people neglect to neglect hi highlighting the design at the top of the portfolio, right? And really just kind of digging into this hierarchy of clarity, concision, helpfulness, and personality, and the amount of weight that each should have. So just wanted to cover that. Last Yesterday, we also had Haskew, the co-founder of cofolios.com. Cofolios is a place where many interns at prominent tech companies showcase their work. Haskew is the co-founder and curator of said site. So in a way, he built the portfolio site of portfolios. Um, and his main points were make sure that your portfolio is memorable, that you're showing, not telling, that you are extremely visual, and that portfolios require a lot of hard work. When you see somebody's portfolio out there and it looks beautiful and pristine and clear, right? There's many people hours behind that that makes that happen. Um, and just kind of like focusing in on the swan. Portfolios are like swans, right? You see them gliding along the water, but underneath there's so much effort that's being put into it. So we want to just make sure that we're honoring that effort and, and showing respect in, to the folks who are working on these portfolios. All right, so we're getting into the portfolios. These are the folks that we have uh, selected. We uh, picked them from a range of portfolios that have been submitted uh, to sort of represent um, just and highlight key points that everyone can benefit from. So this first portfolio is going to be coming from Kate, uh, product UX UI designer. I'm going to pull up the site and I'm also going to start with uh, Crandall. Crandall, if you have any, oh, there's Kate. Kate's in the chat. What's up, Kate? So good to see you. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, Crandall. Uh, any any insights to just begin with um, in approaching this site? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think the overall the site is really is pretty solid. I think it definitely is simple, which is really helping to highlight the work. And I think the most successful thing, at least from the landing page, and I'm sure we'll get into some of like the product page and project page specifically, um, is that the thumbnails here, I think, do a really good job at showing the diversity of the work that uh, this person does, right? So it's like, I get pretty quickly from uh, just glancing, it's like, okay, there's probably a design system in there, there's an app, there's a responsive web, um, or like at least like multi-platform. Um, site. But I think overall, like, that's um, what I really enjoyed about this. Um, and then I do think like, just from a high level, um, I think for me, the wording on your headline um, is a bit unfinished, right? So like, um, a product in UX UI designer bringing meaningful experiences, um, and who loves to doodle, I think for me, it's like, Bring, who do you bring meaningful experiences to? Where are they being brought? What is that, like what makes things meaningful um, to you? But those are my like just high level thoughts from from the homepage, but would love to open it up. Okay, so, so you mentioned also like a bit of work and I see here that in this document you began to like highlight. So, you know, you're, you're appreciative of these thumbnails, right? And the way that they kind of highlight and, and showcase the work, right? It invites you in um, the, the, the projects itself right here. Um, any, yeah. any comments on that? Yeah, I, I think this is a tricky problem that a lot of people deal with, which is um NDAs and not being able to put your work out on um like openly um and so you like I there's totally that concern of like having password protected um but like these are the things people are going to want to see and like are going to get you you know into conversations with recruiters and hiring managers and so I think like for me the two things would be trying to figure out a way to bring the uh optimization of the design system onto the homepage so it's not buried because that's one like really solid professional work and then I think the other one on the redesigning um, if it's not there it's not there like don't tell me that there's going to be something that I can't see I think that's like kind of just like unnecessarily wetting the palette for something that's not able to be like dug into um, I think that would be great to like follow up in actual conversation but at this point it's kind of just like it just feels unfinished to me. Gotcha. All right, cool. So I'm going to pass it on next to Bobbert. Bobbert, is there anything that you would like to speak to with regards to uh, Kate's portfolio? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, just want to plus one a lot of what Crandall said. And also just, again, like 
kudos for including some of these doodles at the beginning or at the homepage. I feel like brand and identity is a huge part of like making a portfolio memorable, like Mickey was mentioning. So um, love that we love the, this inclusion of it. Um, I actually want to jump a little bit into I think the second project on their portfolio, the travel travelesco. There it is. Um, wanted to comment a little bit about like the length of some of the case studies here, uh, especially like this one, um, as well as like some of the images that we're using. Um, I'm wondering, at least like as we're scrolling, scrolling through here right now, could some of these images start to communicate what you're trying to say instead of like you having to spell it out, spell it out in some of the, um, in some of these like uh, sections right here. For So for example, with communication, social, socialization, do you have to have all this information on there? Um, I think another way of putting it too is that um, when there's a lot of information being presented uh, to folks all at once, um, the first thing that, especially like what I try to do, um, is to pick the thing that matters the most to me, or find the thing that matters the most to me. But when there's too many things on the page, it starts to get a little too, um, a little too fuzzy. Um, I think another thing that I'm noticing here, uh, we could probably maybe stop at like any of the sections that have like a body paragraph on it. Maybe if we scroll a little bit, yeah, right there is all, all good. Mm -hmm. uh, I think especially like on web, uh, some of the longer line links on the paragraph start to make the copy a little bit harder to read than it should be. So for example, there might be like over 15 words on this one line. Um, and so I would consider like, does all of this copy need to be incorporated? Can it be told in the visuals alone? Um, could you shorten some of the copy um, or some of the line links? And I think relatedly to that, uh, could we look for moments to start combining some of the sections? So. Um, I think we had one section where we had, I think closer to the top with like user interviews and um, insights, if you could scroll up there, has a microphone doodle um, next to it. Gotcha, right here. Yeah, there it is. Um, you know, with user interviews, you're explaining the methodology that you're using. And then with the insights, you're explaining what you found from it. I'm wondering like, could that just be one section instead of having it separated out, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, um, that could also condense it a little bit more, but also just make it a little bit more focused uh, for the for the uh, reader. Uh, but um, yeah, the all. one yeah the one thing that I would like just kind of like add to that is you know think about adding the context of of like what's important you know when it's important because you know uh, we were kind of talking about this a little bit yesterday where you know you you have all of these different parts and you kind of like build up. Um, but then you're not really connecting the dots of like how one thing led to the next. So sometimes showing the process and the context of the work maybe is a little bit helpful. All right. I'm going to also pass it on to Chia. Chia, do you have any points that you would like to, to, I can see you talking about the persona here and the learnings. Is there anything you would like to add to this conversation as well? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, most of my comments are also in relation to uh, this case study, which is, I think it's the second project listed in, Kate's, um, I guess, like index, but then it's also like the only one that we can actually read through. So I just wanted to flag that thing about NDAs earlier as well. Like it was hard to believe that the first project is like NDA protected. So probably like maybe reorder them. Um, for this project, something that I was struggling with and kind of like mirrors my struggles also when I was like a new grad designer was that the bulk of the case study um, goes pretty in depth into like process and making like um, lo-fi sketches and mapping out user journeys, which is an important part of like the product design toolkit. But I'm not really sure if it's entirely necessary to show this. Um, you can think about this as like, as you are working as a product designer, you have this tool set and it's kind of like presumed that this is standard, that you know what a user persona is, that you know what a journey is. And I'm not sure if it should be given this much weight. Um, rather, what is interesting as a product designer, what is interesting as um, for you to showcase rather is like actually how you execute and how you iterate on your designs. So what I'm really looking for when I scrolled through this case study was um, what were the flows that Kate ended up making that kind of like broke down um, what the app needed. And this is like how I would evaluate um, their product thinking. This is how I would like zoom in and actually see the visual details of each design. And I'm not sure if it was given enough space in the case study. Um, like I appreciate the videos. I think videos are always a great way to highlight um, the designs that you do. But I would actually like more of a breakdown of each of these flows because 
if you think about it, like even skimming through, this app is doing a lot. Like you can get information about different schools and you can track progress and there's like a social aspect. And if you think about it, there are like apps dedicated to fulfilling each purpose or each of those singular like tasks individually. Um, and I'd rather see kind of like a granular breakdown of one of these flows and how it's done really well. Um, the visual details of it, how information hierarchy and content was organized. For instance, you can already think about like um, the information you would display about each school as like an important thing that you could iterate on and then like change in user tests. Um, so I think I just wanted to see more space on like how these final designs were landed on and the iterations that were gone through, especially because I can see that Kate did a lot of like user testing um, to get to these designs. And maybe I just wanted more context on how these like higher fidelity like versions of the prototype were landed on. Um, something I also liked um, towards the end was that there was a functioning prototype. I don't think it should be the only way to showcase a case study. I think this is around the user feedback section. And I like that there's Kate's um, kind of signature doodle try it out thing that actually calls attention to the fact that this is a working prototype that you can play with, um, which I think is a nice to have um, and is a nice extra. But I would really love to see more of a breakdown on those final designs and those features. Like I just want to see like one flow laid out like really well. Um, I honestly don't need to see as much um, in the process, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that that was something that was highlighted yesterday as well. It's like oftentimes we're given these tasks, especially if this is part of like a boot camp or a class, we're given all these tasks. So we did all this work and it's like we want to showcase it all. And we 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 have this tendency to showcase it in a way that it was um, assigned to us when in reality, you know, a recruiter, a hiring manager, even just another designer, they want to see the work first. So, you know, it could be a matter of like starting with the solution and in the context of the solution, highlighting, you know, what sort of things that you did that helped that. And like, you know, Chia was mentioning the iterations, demonstrating the uh, progression of a design is like just as important. It's if not more important than some of that other process that led up to it. Now, granted, if you're going to be like a UX researcher versus like a, like a designer, you know, there's going to be different weight appointed to like the, the different steps of the process. Uh, so that's, that's up to you to uh, infer with regards to like what it is that you're going to be applying for, but because these are typically going to be design roles, yeah, focus on that solution, um, get to that a little bit sooner. Um, and then highlight the work first, you know, like, you know, you, you put that, that larger name in front of the other one, having someone go there, see that it's NDA, uh, it's going to, you know, it's going to impact the way that they say, you know, people have very uh, short timelines when they're looking at this stuff. So you want to make sure that you're giving them what they want to see uh, um, immediately. All right. Brilliant. Nice work, Kate. Thank you, everybody. All right. Next, we're going to do uh, Vaishnavi. And I'm going to open up this page and we're going to start with Chia once again. Um, any overall comments to begin? Yeah, um, Rishnavi is presenting this portfolio, to my understanding, um, as a product designer and a product manager. So clearly we can see that they wear a bunch of hats and this is demonstrated in the front page of their website. It's very nice to see that they do talks and speaking and they're kind of involved with like education efforts and they have the feedback to back it up. And this is something that um, I think a lot of students are really figuring out, right? Like they are multifaceted. How do they present like all their different strengths, especially as someone who can literally like take on different roles. And I think this is like the main challenge of sites like this. I, I like the visuals. Um, they clearly have like visual skills. And I think um, something I struggled with was the presentation of the projects and actually diving into them as a product designer or a, a product manager, um, because they're attempting to present themselves as two different roles at once. I don't know if either is given sufficient attention. Um, for instance, the way that things from, the way that professional updates and talks are presented are in the same format or are given the same weight as um, case studies that I would like to see from them as a designer. So say I'm a product designer recruiter or I'm potentially gonna work with them on design 
I have to kind of sift through a bunch of unrelated things. Um, and I think if you're like multifaceted, especially um, like in this case, this might be an area where you actually have to kind of like segment how you're presenting yourself and make different sites for it, unfortunately. Um, and another thing I was struggling with when visiting the site was that some projects are decks, some are key studies in our individual pages, et cetera. So it would be great to align these so that you have more control over the narrative. Um, it's a bit confusing, for instance, that I have to like kind of navigate um, a deck versus um, like a generic um, kind of like narrative template. Um, it would be better if these were like a bit more aligned. All right. So yeah, I would agree. Like um, I'm kind of moving through here and, and it's like, I, it's, I don't necessarily know what I'm going to see. So even here it's like freelance and templates and I see a community page. So there's, there's kind of like this like sense of like, I don't necessarily know the expectation of what it might be. So like setting that, that appropriately, I'm going to head back over here. Also, these are, these are all opening as like separate individual pages. So I have like tab after tab after tab. So there's something to be said to like about that. Uh, let me close that up. There we go. Um, next up, uh, let's see, Alex. What what do you have to say? Yeah, I definitely, I definitely second um, everything she has said. I think for me, like it's really clear that this person has a point of view and a level of taste that is high. Um, I agree. I agree. Like overall, like with all the structural feedback. Um, I think for me, like this, some of the commitment to the aesthetic is actually a bit overwhelming like all the static um and like noise um and all the like pan zooms they kind of actually like in spending time on the site made it a bit like difficult to spend time because it's like actually kind of starting to hurt my eyes a little bit um but I think for me it's really just again I, I I think for me the big thing is also like some of the positioning of the projects like on the site itself, there's a project that's just called usability. And then there's a picture of Mickey and Minnie Mouse. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what that has to do with that, with usability. Um, I, and it's not, and I think like that links to a Figma uh, presentation deck. And it's like, um, it's not really clearly explained like how you're tying usability to Disneyland. Um, I'm sure it's in there but it's like i i don't need i don't have the time to be sifting through and trying to figure that out um but i do think like this is a really elegantly designed site i think there's just like a bit of a like organizational polish that really needs to happen um for it to continue to grow and like be successful um but I think I think the big thing that she said that I would echo is like it's unclear who this site is for, right? Because it's like, do you want to get more talks? Do you want to get a job as a product manager, product designer? I'm sure. I think right now the answer is all three, and you're not really giving yourself the chance to succeed in any of the three because you're trying to do them all from one link. And I really think you would benefit. Um, this person would benefit from having like multiple sites for their speaking engagement, their designer roles. Um, and that'll also just make it easier when you are applying to a diversity of things. Yeah, I would agree. Like just the uh, the presentation of the site is like initially compelling, but then once you try to go one level deeper, like it can be difficult to extract the clarity from it and know as somebody who's going to hire this individual, like you're not, it's not being clearly communicated to them. So, you know, at face value, like, okay, cool, like really cool effects. I'm really feeling this, but ultimately at the end of the day, you know, especially like in a career, early career role, you need to consider, you know, the purpose, like what is the, the goal of the site, what it is that you're trying to accomplish. All right. So we're actually going to move on to the next individual here. We got Melissa. Uh, Melissa, uh, we're going to start off. Actually, we're going to start off with Bobbert. Um, Bobbert, what are your initial impressions of Melissa Lau's site? Yes, Melissa, clean, clean, clean site. Um, love the visuals here. Love the simplicity um, of the homepage itself. Uh, pretty clear understanding of like how to 
and navigate to each of the case studies. Um, one thing that I was noticing, and this was something that uh, I think Randall and I were taught were uh, seeing in some of our notes, um, was that I think like some of the images on the case studies were a little bit too small on some um, to the point where you can't like you know we're not really celebrating some of that work, um, or it's a little bit harder to see some of those more intricate details. Um, one thing that I wanted to jump into was I think in the first case study I think it's called Piggy there. Mm -hmm. If you jump into that, um, I wanted to try to like zoom in into some of the different sections of this page. So I think one that we could probably jump into first is um, if you scroll down to like the key takeaways section. Key takeaways. Yep. Yeah, there it is. Um, so I love this insight to opportunity back and forth. And I think one way that I want to challenge you is to condense this down even further, you know. Um, I think we've talked a bit, a bit about having longer case studies, um, but again, I think we want to reiterate that uh, the narrative is here for you to control, but it also that also means that uh, it, it's you can control the amount that we have to read and parse through the information. Um, you know, this might be a use case for something like ChatGPT or some other AI assistant to help condensing down um, the the uh, the words. Um, again, like still plan to work with someone who might be good with words or even just, you know, making sure that your your tone and personality are still uh, communicating through the copy. Um, but I, I do think that, uh, you know, there are many ways that you can try to reduce that down a little bit more. Um, moving into a different section, I think uh, there's a section where we have primary research. Um, if we scroll, yeah, it's right there. We might want to maybe do like a command minus on this. Um, just like zoom out just a tiny bit if that's possible. But oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one thing that I was considering here is also related to like condensing, um, but also just like does does uh, the, the reader really need to know all of this information? Um, she was talking about this with another case study, um, but I want to you know go back to that question: Does this support the narrative that you're trying to build with your website? Um, if there's all this information about primary research. Um, is it pointing you more towards being a researcher versus a product designer? Um, and also, again, uh, how does this information condense down to your final designs? There's the longer it is, the harder it is to make that connection to the to that. Um, yeah, I like I like the way that you put that. You know, just evaluating every section. Like, does this support the narrative that I'm trying to present with my work? You know, oftentimes, like, I think folks lay everything out and they expect the viewer to make all the connections. And you have to, once again, you have to consider your portfolio as being identified or reviewed by someone. You have to think of that as like a problem solving situation. Um, another thing that we talked about, we haven't really addressed it here today, is that oftentimes there's going to be the portfolio that you have on a website. And then there's going to be maybe a, a deck or a presentation of your work that you're going to make as, as part of your, your application or your interview process, right? Uh, with the deck, you have the opportunity for more space uh, to control the narrative, to give that presentation, to like highlight some of these things. Here, you don't have such a captive audience. And it's much diff it's much more difficult for an individual to um, see all the connections of that process and how it ultimately impacts your work. So, you know, I think a word here would be like curate. You know, it's like considering how you curate the process, how you make it relevant, and how you are are coordinating it. Um, as being impactful in the way that you made your decisions. So I think one here thing that's here, it's kind of fun. I just noticed it is that you're kind of showing at least like a little bit of development of, of, of fidelity um, and iterations. All right. So next up, um, who's next on deck? Chia, are we back to you? I think we're back to you. Uh, any, any comments on Melissa's work? Yeah. Um, when I was going over Melissa's portfolio, um, something that stood out to me and something I was keeping in mind was that this is a designer who's making kind of a career transition from doing marketing and graphic design and content oriented roles to product design. Um, and with that in mind, I was looking through the piggy case study, um, trying to understand how this visual design kind of background and craft um, was aiding um, their work. And it was a bit, I mean, I was like 
trying to understand it um, while going through this kind of speculative case study. Um, to my understanding, it, it wasn't made for a real world client. And there were like, like these moments where um, at the latter end of the case study where Melissa kind of shows um, the piggy app that they ended up with, where I really appreciate the detail to animation. Um, I also noticed that they were like doing a lot of illustrations and the mockups and whatnot. And I think I just wanted like clarity on like which parts were illustrated by them. Um, which areas were like lifted from an existing icon set because it would really um, help, I guess, like the reader gauge um, Melissa's like visual craft a bit more. Um, there were also other tidbits that stood out to me, for instance, the fact that there was a web version with like some interesting decisions on how um, components would slide out and whatnot, which makes me think that this designer is thinking about mobile and web responsiveness. Um, that I wish were expounded a bit more. Something that I think also happens a lot in these kind of like final design presentations is that people tend to showcase like everything from end to end because you built something end to end, which means that they begin with onboarding um, and then the dashboard and then maybe more interesting sequences. And this makes me think like maybe you can reorder the narrative and be a bit more in control of it. And instead of like showcasing like a generic like login or sign up flow, instead um highlight maybe like interesting kind of granular details and micro interactions that you accomplished in this like speculative app that maybe other apps in this space don't have um i appreciate like the layout of screens i can see that there's a lot of like good visual design craft and skills but then I don't know if they're ordered in a way where I'm given the best opportunity to kind of like gauge um, Melissa's ability to like, I don't know, like mediate kind of like weird complex interactions or like end states together. Yeah, so I think like the thing that I'm I'm kind of hearing here, like like the pattern is just like spend more time with these details you know, elaborate in, like hone in on like a micro interaction that is novel. So as you were saying, take the opportunity to find something that usually isn't um, handled in this space well, you know, so like you're, we're dealing with kind of like the billing subscription. So like lean into the novel or the innovation that you're doing. So you're, you're creating and uh, so one, making sure you're identifying that these illustrations are your own and, and, and owning that maybe highlighting a bit of process, you know, just taking an opportunity to be like, okay, this is truly unique and, and, and work generated by the, by the designer. And, and one thing that I always say in portfolios, it's like, you know, like show the work that you actually want to do. Um, and there might be a case where they're looking for a product designer with illustrative capabilities. And if that's something you genuinely want to do, make sure you lean into it. Or if it's not, you know, make sure you're emphasizing that these were appropriated from like a stock site or something. People appreciate that level of, of candidness. They, they, they want to know. Um, so it's better to let them know than to keep them guessing because it's more often than not that, yeah, you're in a real role. You're going to hire an illustrator for these. Um, so it's okay. Like you don't have to do the, the end to end on it, but to just be very clear, what is your work and not. And in that, you know, highlighting that micro interaction, showing that animation, showing a breakdown uh, for product design, there's always going to be an evaluation of craft. And that craft is really going to be demonstrated when they, when they see that animation, when they see that progression, when they see the iteration on that work. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we're going to move on to Mika and we're going to kick it off with uh, Alex. We have Mika's work here. Alex, uh, take it away. Crandall, yeah. sorry, Crandall. Yeah. I'm gonna keep doing that. Yeah, there you go. Okay, man. Um, yeah, I mean, overall, I would I think here, like the homepage of the site, like it's pretty well laid out. The type is nice. I would actually love to just dive into this first case study. Um, I agree, I do like these fun little hover states. They're a nice gesture of like again that illustration feel. Um, I think this is a pretty solid, just like representative case study of I think the the lot of stuff that we've seen, um, and I would love to just like point out a few things on this. Um, so I think overall, like 
there is a tendency in this case study to, I think, over explain some things. Um, I love um, this section, the problem section, I think is incredibly strong, right? It lays it out in a hard, cold fact of like, okay, what are you trying to change? I'm trying to change that like 30% of users don't make a transaction. I think if you can try and like make that really clear up at the top, I think you dedicate, I think there's a lot of space dedicated to explaining the company, which I think is, I, I understand like there's a, a cultural barrier of like the world understanding what like a sorry, sorry story is, but it's also like, I think we colloquially have our own names for that. So I think you could reduce that and really focus on getting into the work um, and really laying this out. Um, and I think this, the thing that's like really stands out about this case study is it's actually showing, telling a really great story, which is like getting to a solution that had like a 27% conversion rate on something, um, I think is what it said. And I think it just is I think it gets really buried under a lot of this. I know um, Bobber called this out where it's like, one, I, like these illustrations and uh, screens are great. Like the one up at the top with like the three, highlighting the three problems. Um, but like, that's, a, that's overwhelming to look at where it's like, the information is really small. The illustrations are really big. The screen are kind of like low, like hard to, um actually make out um and i think it's just like one of those things where it's like it just doesn't actually communicate as well it's something that was like more simplified um but i think that and i think that's just like overall and would love for other people to jump in but also i think down towards the bottom the takeaways um like all the way down to bottom it's going to be a long Ooh. it's a bit of a scroll right, we're keep on going let's um, go um Take ways. Yeah. So this, yeah. So, so that, this is, I'm sure there's great insights in here. I didn't read it because it's a lot. Um, and I think that goes back to like um, what Bauer was saying is like, there's, this reads like a lot of text. It's really long. It, like the line lengths are really long. I would try and like trying to figure out one, how do you make a visual to celebrate your takeaways and your learnings, both from a quantitative like change and from like that emotional growth of an internship um, that I think you're trying to highlight here. And how do you like just overall reduce and synthesize your message? Um, but I think like this case study tells a really impactful story. It's just not doing, it's just not doing the, um, it's just not um, celebrating all the like the actual like result um, because it's kind of gets buried in a lot of words and um, a lot of information. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like you know, think of the way to just be more, and it, and it's difficult. It's difficult to be succinct. It's it difficult is. to you know almost do justice to the work. And and you know we're buried in the work, and we want to make sure that we put every single word out there. Um, you know, you can hold on to that work. You can have that like complete case study. You know, you can have that there, but ultimately making it more scannable um, can can really just help it. Like it's like good typography makes a user want to read that text. So how can that be crafted in a way? Uh, let's take a quick hop on over to Bobbert. Bobbert, do you have any uh, uh, comments on on this site as well? For um, wanna, for Mika, I definitely want to plus one the discussion already about you know celebrating the work. Um, like this is you you made fantastic work, and it, but it is still hard to see. And I think I want to I want to go over that point a little bit more. Um, there were moments like uh, um, there were moments. I think if you scroll down to the oh, if you go do the first case study again one more time, sure. Yep. And then dive into the section that might read like, how might we suggest users to add their items to their cart? Yeah. By the way, this command F in searching for certain things, like I'll be doing that too. So, like you know, optimize your page to, uh, you know, have the right keywords as well. Okay, so the how might we right here? Yeah, yeah. there you yeah. go. There you go. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are moments where. Mm -hmm. 
the, you know, there are opportunities where you can combine the images and text a little bit better. Um, some of the captions, some of the um, images themselves have text inside of them. Um, but really that first line in that caption is the most important insight of the section, but it's buried in that body copy. Um, so I'm wondering like, you know, could you make those insights in that section header um, a little bit more clear? Um, and then again, like upping the visual so that we can see what is actually on that phone screen. Um, there was a there was a tip um, in the slides that Miggy presented like a little bit earlier or at the beginning of the presentation where it's about having that final design at the very top of your of your website and I think this case study and some of your other case studies are a perfect example of like when you know you could do that that way we can dive into the work first and then understand the, the cultural context or whatever other context related um, to it right after um, but since we start with the cultural context we sort of have to sift through it. Um, which makes it harder to engage with it um, and then just makes more of, you know, reading through the rest of the content um, a little bit less uh, motivating, if that makes sense. Yeah, I like that. You know, sometimes you need to start at the end and then like work your way back. And when it comes to folks reviewing your work, starting at the end, showing the work gives them the context to then want to delve deeper. Um, it also gives them a frame of reference. So when they're reading your process, when they're kind of discovering and breaking apart, you know, Chia even mentioned, they want to see the the actual flow. They want to see prototypes. Um, show them the prototype and then deconstruct the choices made. Chunk things out in a way that, that really does work. The one thing that I would say here too is that, you know, yeah, we have a tendency to want to show the whole UI. There's no reason you can't zoom in and just show a portion, you know, highlight that card. Highlight the thing that you put time and effort into and, and maybe deconstruct it in a way that's meaningful. You know, if you think of photography, right, you have an establishing shot where you see the whole scene, then you might have like a mid-range shot where you're a little bit more focused. So on a landscape, you might start to focus in a little bit more on the trees or like a mountain. Um, and then you go one step deeper. So think about whether you're establishing shot, you're in a mid-range shot, or you're in a close-up. Um, and treat your work the same way because that's how folks are going to be evaluating. And they do want to see those details. And, and you have the power to, to, to bring that camera right up uh, to those important details and, and highlight to the person reviewing your work to say, this is what I think is important. And people want to know that. They want to see what your curiosity is and they want to see what it is that you value. Um, I feel like early career folks have a tendency to want to put everything out and then say, here, you're going to find what you're looking for in this. I put everything out here. Um, being able to curate and highlight, I think is going to be really important. Uh, okay, cool. How are we doing? Uh, let's get to one more. And Chia, I'm going to have you kick us off with Joyce. Yeah. Um, the first thing I noticed about Joyce's portfolio, this is obviously a product designer who seems to have great dev skills. I mean, I can tell that this is not um, a generic kind of like Squarespace templates, which is also totally fine, but I can tell that they put a lot of care into um, the interactions and making their own like type system and developing it themselves. You can tell immediately from the kind of unique navigation toolbar at the bottom. Um, and I wanted to dive right into the case studies, but then the immediate issue that I think um, the others on the panel list was that it was just a bit hard to kind of enter the case studies. Um, the only clickable area here is this like tiny view case study button. And even though like the easing and the animation is like unique and beautiful, it's just like way too tiny compared to other things on the screen. Um, and then kind of going into Divi. Um, first thing, the hero shot is really good. I get like a glimpse of the um of the app, even though it's a stylized shot, it still looks pretty parsable. Um, going into the case study, something that I was struggling a bit with, what is, for one, this is kind of like um, uh, a class project, um, is my understanding from the context setting. And I think I was given kind of context that might not be entirely necessary, like the delving into the problem and then the roles in the team is maybe good extra context to present once you're in that um, once someone has extra questions or once, or once you're presenting this in like a portfolio review when you're applying for an internship, but does it need to be like here um, on your site? Um, 
it's also like a pretty digestible kind of like problem like everyone relates to the issue of splitting the bill so I'm not sure how necessary it is to dive into these things um for instance scrolling a bit down we see this kind of like photo that is a bunch of post-it notes um where I think Joyce was like with their classmates and like thinking about what features this app would like this is like interesting but would be more interesting if I understood if I like had understanding of what Joyce did as a designer like how did they in their role like mediate how to actually prioritize these things like did they compare it with other um apps that are trying to do the same thing um did they make any trade-offs or did they discuss with like the developer who was working on it because to my understanding someone else is doing the dev for it um on like what is worth pursuing um were some of these mediated through user research and I wish this was like displayed in like one image as opposed to like a post-it note display that I don't really know what it's supposed to tell me aside from like they have a lot of ideas, but what was done with it is what I'm more interested in. Um, scrolling further down, um, I think a lot of these portfolios um, are attempting to show like rigor and like breadth of iterations by like showing a screenshot of like, I mean like X amount of screens. And this is great, um, but it's also kind of like expected in the design process. It's good to show as a snapshot somewhere, but not when it's like a leading image. Um, my focus was more drawn towards the flows, um, towards the end, like after this like Figma screenshot, but it was honestly a bit hard to parse. And I was trying to understand like, are these images just like artifacts arranged for this case study on the site? Or was this how Joyce communicated it to other people on their team? I'm not really sure to what um, purpose these artifacts were like set up. And it's a bit like hard to understand the flows. I understand this is like a work in progress project, um, but also like it's, I'm not really sure um, where like to draw focus on or what stage um, the design is in or what flows are to focus on or how like these product features are being like decided on. And this is not something that Joyce obviously has to decide entirely on their own. Um, but it was something I wish I had a bit more clarity on. Like what in their role as a designer are they focusing on? Where are they making trade-offs? Um, where are they, um, or what design details have they already sweated on and what are they holding off for a bit later? Um, and I think um, some of the details here where I'm seeing like things that are too macro scale or things that are more like the collaboration and team structure are deviating from being able to or for me being able to understand Joyce as a designer. Yeah, I would say that uh, I feel like the thing that you're honing in on here is almost like a lack of context. So even here, that's like, okay, we brainstormed and then, you know, that we're not being led through the content here. You know, we don't necessarily know what to pay quite attention to. Um, so I feel the same sort of tension here where there's 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 some notes but they're not necessarily associated with things like existing group flow. Is is this the existing group flow? Is this the existing group flow? These little notes here are difficult to associate, you know, whereas if this is very cleanly like arranged, like first thing, second thing, third thing, understanding, you know, what this artifact embodies, what stage of the process what was the role of the user in, in kind of conceiving it and, and and what was the yield of this this activity or this this artifact so um just just emphasizing on that clarity aspect i think is like really key would you say chia oh i was just just wondering if you would agree it like i was you know making sure i was kind of honing in on where you're getting at there no i definitely agree with um difficulty associating the text to the screen yeah all right cool so we are going to head on out. I know we have a few extra portfolios there, but we're going to head on out to, to general notes. I know we saw a few portfolios here. Um, one thing that we noticed is that reviewers were just kind of leaving notes that that everyone could kind of benefit from. And we would like to, to kind of head, hand off to, to some of these. Uh, Alex, I'm going to start with you. Uh, I know that you had a, a few of these here. Is there anything that you would like to highlight or call out um, just like as an amalgam, like benefits or things that everybody here today can learn from? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, everyone has kind of said this. I think for me, the big thing um, about portfolios is like a successful portfolio to me is not a thing that gives me all the answers about a project. It makes me want to ask you questions um, about the project and like, <laughs> hence me like wanting to like pull you into an interview. I think for me, it's really about like controlling and shaping interesting, simple to parse through um visual uh visual stories um and i think the big thing for me that i then um so that's like a macro thing and then i think on the micro um like very nitpicky thing i think there's two just like trends in portfolios both in this lot and generally that i think is wow okay thanks <laughs> um love that photo of me buddy um is the two macro things i i'm sorry the two like super nitpicky things i would say is like is one like um don't obscure the visuals like make them really big don't put them like in isometric mock-ups just because that looks cool um it does look cool but it's also like not actually showing your work as well um as it could be um and then i think the other thing is i i know it's really easy to go from like mocking up a full page in figma and exporting that and just putting the image of that out there that is like not to me like if you can avoid that i know it's like really great speed to launch into site thing um uh, but is like one it's not screen readable it's not accessible and it has no mobile responsiveness so like uh you are um basically putting yourself at the mercy of a very specific contextual situation if you are just uploading a really long pdf or image of your of a page and saying that is the page um so i think like if you are working like working towards it and you need to get up quickly that's totally fine um but just like make sure you are working to optimize the experience for the viewer awesome thank you uh, Bobbert, um, any general notes, key takeaways for our audience today? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, starting with that first one, um, you you guys own your own story, you know, like uh, you have complete control over what gets shown, um, what, like how you write those words on there, how you explain your story to it. And sometimes, you know, a project, for example, might not go too well, but you can instead focus on the positives of it, right? Um, you can focus on the things you've learned and then you can highlight those things um, in, in, that, in that project uh, description. Um, and to that second point there, like less is better, you know, 100%, like be intentional about the, the um, content that you include in your, in your project pages. Um, think about how the words and the visuals start to affect like someone, how someone might perceive your project. Um, again, you can, you can change how folks uh, think about um, a certain project, um, depending on how you frame it. Um, I just also want to reiterate like TLDR is at the very top. Um, that's a big thing that we do here at Duolingo. Um, but I think it's just general good advice all around. Um, try to explain your project in, or I have this uh, exercise where you can try to explain your project in less than two words, uh, then in less than eight words, and then try to explain it in less than 24 words. And then that way you can develop your own title, which is that two word one, uh, the headliner, um, which is eight words, and then that TLDR statement. Um, so when you can get people into those projects with that clear understanding about what that thing you're about to show them is, that should get them a lot more excited about what they're about to see and read through. Um, and then this last sticky note here is all about designing your portfolio for three types of readers, but um, mostly like that last one that I have on there, um, there's the skimmer, they only look at titles and images. There's like that bookworm um, kind of persona. They look at every single piece of text and try to zoom into every single image. And then, you know, that third one, which is the general population. So we look at the most important call outs, the text and the visuals. So again, just make sure that they're simple and easy to parse and that you do have those call outs so that people don't have to go into all that body copy. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, Chia, we're running a little short on time, but uh, any things that you want to highlight? Yeah, I'll just summarize. I won't read from my post notes because they are very TLDR. Um, Robert gave really like great specific. Um, and like quantitative advice. So plus one to that and also everything that Kendall said. Um, something I will speak to, especially as a new grad designer last year, is that I think it's very tempting to want to be unique, to want to stand out, to plus over 
what site builder you're on or what technologies you're using. Um, but really kind of like getting a design job is kind of like applying to college where first like sweat about the, about like getting the fundamentals down, like make sure your spacing, padding and typography is, is like perfect. Make sure your images are clear and really the granular details of whether you have a Figma prototype embedded or not matters less. Um, really just like get your narrative down. Um, you don't need all these extras um, because if your images aren't working or your case studies are hard to access and if your things aren't parsable, then you won't even get to this stage where people get to like care about all those extras that you can do. Um, so I think that's what I'd focus on first. Like first meet those fundamentals, get your get a very concise narrative down and then you can focus on like all those extras that make you unique because generally as a designer you just or as a student designer you want to just show that you're a generalist like you know how to do you know how to make a prototype you know like the basics of interactivity you have visual design skills and you're beginning to develop taste you don't need to have a good taste yet you just need to show that you're teachable and are a generalist you don't need to like excel at anything um and that's like all you really need to show um, and make sure you know your audience. And this is like not the time to like worry about being unique or standing out yet because you're a designer and you're just getting your first job, honestly. Awesome. That's like really good advice. Um, and I think that, that that kind of echoes what we were talking about yesterday um, in Tammy's deck where personality, like the whole part about being unique, yes, it's important, but you want to use it sparingly. You really want to identify that clarity, being concise and that helpfulness, you know, think of your portfolio as a tool designed for it, thinking of it as a, as a problem that you're solving for, for your given audiences. Everybody here keeps mentioning the audience. The audience isn't necessarily going to be you. It's going to be somebody reviewing your work and how you tell those stories is going to be really impactful. Um, so Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everybody who has submitted your portfolios. The, your work is great. Um, you know, make sure you, you you take this critique with 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 our understandings to to try to give you some insights to to make your work more actionable. Right? We're just here to to try and support you as best as we can. So, with that, day two of early career week portfolio edition has come to a close.